organizations these days for whatever reason uh, have uh, adopted Agile or in the process of adopting Agile and you should be interested in knowing when Agile breaks. What are those things that would you know, pull uh, you know, Agile going to meeting its maximum speed? So that basically is the intent of this talk. And before I talk, I need to understand uh, the crowd. I've been saying from morning uh, that the crowd is a little tough, uh, not so interactive to the extent that I was expecting. So uh, we need to have uh, a nice break. Wait, this isn't working. Okay. Familiar characters? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, my my trouble is I do not move forward unless I unless I see people as noisy as I am. Okay, and I'm a little deaf, so you got to be loud. Yeah, you had good lunch, if not so great lunch. It's not a home food. So, familiar characters. Yes. Yes. Familiar characters. Yes. Yes. Familiar characters. Yes. Oh, come on. Yes. Familiar characters? Yes. OK. Who is the favorite character in this? Tom or Jerry? Hey, I'm not showing code here. This is stuff that you have seen. Uh, you continue to watch, perhaps, with your kids. Favorite character? Tom. Tom. OK. Uh, first, let's go with uh, Tom. Who, who likes Tom and for what reason? Who are Yeah? He's always a poor guy. Tom is a poor guy and so he likes him. Okay, socialist. <laughs> Any other answer? He never gives up. Uh, yeah, so, exactly. I mean, he never, never gives up. He, okay, he never gives up. Okay. Yeah, right. Despite of the fact that he, he gets bogged down with you know, Jerry quite often, <laughs> but still he follows him you know, everywhere. Okay. Yeah? Any other reason? Any other reason for liking Tom? No other reason, is it? Okay. For those people who like Jerry, why do they like Jerry? He's very? Jerry is very tricky. Okay. You like your manager? <laughs> you are a manager yourself, is it? Manager. I mean, there's been a lot of jokes going around on manager, poor managers. Uh, so, just kind of a joke. Took the liberty for it. Uh, okay, any other reason for liking Jack? Sorry? He's smart. He's smart. Okay, any other reason? Is that all? You're thinking? I mean, please not think. I mean, this is, I mean, there are no points to it. Uh, there's no success failure thing. It's okay being. I mean, it's your subjective thing. You like a character for what it is, and it depends. He's quite adaptive. He's, he thinks on his feet. He's ready to make changes as he wants. Who the Tom or Jerry? Jerry? Jerry is very adaptive. He's very adaptive to changes. No matter what change Tom brings, Jerry is always there to break it. Okay, cool. So that, that makes it interesting. Okay. Uh, by the way, this has got nothing to do with my session. I just had it because we need to break. We basically have to, you know. Uh, break the silence, bridge the gap between us. Uh, that basically is my idea. And there's also another secret uh, agenda, which is usually the audience have the highest, uh, you know, attention span for the first uh, few minutes or up to five minutes. After that, they're not so attentive. And if you're more attentive to this, the rest of my talk generally goes off easy because you're not very attentive to my talk, and I can blabber anything I like. Uh, so they are stuck. Okay. This has got something to do with my talk perhaps, but we'll figure it out. Uh, you see these characters, uh, three different uh, images there. Uh, which of the character you can associate more to uh, the agile adoption in your you know, uh, company? Uh, which of these uh, images? There's one, two, three, the skeleton class. There's a full uh, muscular uh, man here. There's that skeleton thing. Uh, which do you associate more to, you know, agility in your organization? Answers. Still no points. I mean, there's no winning, no losing. It's okay. It's still your thought process. No answers. Middle one. Middle one. 
Why is it? You follow Scrum, but not any? Okay, so you follow Scrum because you can go about saying, yeah, I follow Scrum. I'm a child. Okay, cool. Fair enough. Any other reasons? Anything else that you associate with? Come on. I mean, I'm not going to give a lecture here. That's not my style. It just doesn't work out. I'm not a great speaker. I know my weakness, which is a reason why I make my talk very interactive. Yeah, and, and uh, my intention is I should learn by the end of this half hour. I should have some takeaways. Yeah, so, then, which you associate to your uh, you know, agility in your business? Which one? The skeleton? Because agile is yet another process. That's how uh, your company calls it as. Or like this. The first picture. Uh, why? Why the first? It's a skill that I can fit in whatever I want and can adapt or I can change things. Okay. Anything else? Nothing. Anyway, I'll leave it uh, to you. I'm not going to. I mean, there's no straight answer. We'll go to things later. Okay, but generally, uh, I see Agile more as this, uh, the first picture, because the way I see Test to true agility the way I have been in a project team is nearly everything matters. It's not like, okay, this is not required, that is not required. Every practice that somebody has put it and or has probably preached it, it's out of their experience. So you'll have to see how your experience and project connects to with that experience and start implementing it in your project. That is true success. So, I mean, you have to see the, see the value out of each pra practice uh, and not see it as mere uh, process. A lot of them uh, take agility as I go to consulting uh, thing. I see people uh, see it more as yet another process, right? You see people actually giggling uh, on the ground saying, okay, yet another process in place. Yesterday it was CMMI, today it is agile. Yeah, we have it all. Okay, so the fun part is probably over. We've got hard lessons in place and that would require uh, you know, you to see as I'm going through, flipping through each of the slides, for you to retrospect to see how it is back at your workplace. Because that alone defines the success of the next half hour that you're going to spend with me. All right, first thing, this one. Uh, like, some of the things that I see a problem as problem in, in the Agile is, is this hierarchy thing. Hierarchy kind of, you know, doesn't help accelerate teams big way, right? Uh, before I move forward, uh, some of the things that I see as problem in hierarchy is hierarchy intrinsically brings in this command and control thing. I'm a superior guy and so I know things better. Happens in your organization, show of hands, right? If you're a boss, you say, I'm a boss, I know it, right? You say it, yes, show of hands. Oh, all liars, is it? Okay, at least you admit your liars with, with that laughter, right? I mean, okay, so, so the best way you can start learning is when you start admitting reality, okay? That, that's, that's really very important. I do not know the number of times that I've failed. I've lost count. I've failed so many times. But it is only those failures and the lessons that I've learned out of the failures has you know, brought me here. Uh, so so it's, it's going to come with you again. Yes, you are kind of familiar with this. Happens, you see your boss saying, "Oh, we got to do this thing," without giving sufficient, you know, reason uh, as to why you got to do it. Yes? Yes? yes. yes? yes. Your bosses are around, so you don't want to show your hands. Or raise your hands up. Let's let's do another vote. Yeah. Show of hands. How many of them love hierarchy? Show of hands. Let's change the question. You love hierarchy. How many of them love hierarchy? How many of them like flat structures? Show of hands. You like flat structures. Oh, come on. Come on. Okay, so, so let's go with the honest person first. You said you like hierarchy. Can you tell me why you like hierarchy? Sorry? Yeah, so, so you like hierarchy because tasks can be... Uh, 
Otherwise, it's a little chaotic. Just about everybody says, okay, I'll do it. Right? Actually, people don't say, I'll do it. They'll do it. Right? It's like the Indian fielders. When boss ball crosses beyond, they'll actually raise hand. Right? Whoever sits outside the boundary, they'll actually pick the ball and throw it to them. That's cool. Okay, so, so here's one reason uh, I, I believe that people like hierarchy. It's because, uh, it, it's again, uh, charity begins at home, they say. Similarly, everything really begins at home. Uh, and usually the relatives. Uh, you probably, if not your dad's friend, your cousin's friend, your sister's friend, your si yeah, somebody who comes from the say, yeah, I am a tech lead in this company. What are you doing? Oh, I'm a developer in this company. Hey, okay, he's a tech lead. I used to say, same cousins, right? So they're the same cousins, this guy's a tech lead, you are still a developer. <coughs> and then somebody says, ah, oh, you're still a business analyst. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, right now a senior business analyst in this company. Yeah? Familiar? Familiar happens at our home. That's how I mean we always crave, right? Oh hell, I need to next to you know break, go to the next hierarchy. This happens? Yes? yes. Okay, uh, show of hands is probably a bad idea. Let's do shouting. I mean, then you do not know who is shouting, right? Yes? Yes. Okay. Yes? Not so loud, probably people have a different idea. If you have a different idea, you gotta you know speak out. Why? Right? So yes? Yes. Okay, now it's a little higher. Okay. So, so, so that's one thing. So you probably want to go home, go back home and say, this is what it is. The other reason that is, is about, it's like people saying, okay, my friend in this company is such and such a uh, position, right? He's in this, he's, he's somewhere growing in the hierarchy, right? So the motivation factor uh, in reality has changed from their nature of job. That's a sad thing. There is so much... Uh, in development. The way at which technology is changing is so crazy. There's so much to learn on the technology front. There's so much that's happening uh, on the business analyst uh, side. Something I can tell from uh, the delivery thing. I've seen business analysts writing poor user stories. Hell no, I mean, pathetic user stories, really long ones, and then say, I do not know how to break these. If any of you have got ideas, well, I'm okay taking it up. That's not being agile. Uh, that's a terrible thing. Uh, business analysts do not spend time reading books. Everything nearly in software development is a craft to be better than, right? Be it software development, I mean, be it coding, be it business analysis, be it writing user stories, be it talking to customers, be it negotiation, be it facilitation. Now, there has been a lot of jokes going around on the manager uh, today, right? Uh, so, but there. Managers have got their own roles to play. Uh, so like Sunil Mudra was talking about servant leadership. So if you are probably in any position of influence, your role changes from giving you know, instructions to actually facilitating uh, to getting things done. Typically things that happen in a project management is conflict between two different roles, between peers. These are things that are so, so common in agile projects. These are not bad at all. If those things happen, it's good. It means people are thinking. People are thinking on their own terms and they are fighting. Managers got to facilitate it. Now typically, uh, do managers do it? Question mark. Uh, is that team lead do it? Question mark. What happens uh, when, when there is a conflict between ideas and projects? Is there somebody who wants to share the story? Any volunteers? Uh, there is no conflict management uh, in projects at all. Things are just smooth because it's one way. Somebody gives an instruction, somebody else does it. Yeah? I mean, you hope that things are being done, at least. You think things are actually going on. In reality, it's not. Okay, so that, that's another trouble. Uh, so, so, before I go to the next slide, I want to ask this. Is any managers here? Uh, I, I'm not going to offend you for sure, definitely. So can you actually stand up and say, what is your role as a manager you're doing in your uh, company? And is it an agile company or it's not? I mean, it's something again. If you can throw some context around, it's good. So I'm managing a couple of uh, agile projects. Uh -huh. Now, uh, one of them, my major challenge, <coughs> you're talking about uh, uh, ensuring that the team is in sync with what the client wants. But again, the, the question is, is the team exactly doing what it, what the customer wants, and do we have the you know uh, the 
deliverables going out on time with good quality. So my job is to ensure that the facilitate. I do, I do the facilitating part of it to ensure that everything is going on, uh, moving ahead on time. Uh, okay. So that's more. Uh, that's what I do. But uh, from my perspective, the biggest challenge that I uh, that I found is that many times during the requirement gathering stage or even during the daily standup, uh, is the entire team truly concentrating on what the product owner is uh, uh, saying there? Are they giving their updates correctly? As in, what are the challenges or what are the blockers that they have? Because many times, what happens is they wait to the last moment to update the product. So, which whether whether it is agile or waterfall, it's kind of holds up. Yeah. So, okay. Fair enough. Thank you very much. So, so as a manager, it's it's like he's saying uh, his job is to make sure uh, people you know come out of their uh, thing and then uh, you know basically do their job right. Uh, so. To me, it's more about yeah, facilitating things. Make sure people come out of their, uh, you know, uh, shell and actually talk. It's about self-discipline. It's about you know, ensuring or inducing that self-discipline in, fo uh, in folks, uh, which is what servant leadership is talking about. Do what it takes to you know, uh, get uh, people on on track. The other thing generally uh, that troubles me and, and uh, that I see in agile companies are these cubicles. Uh, this kind of cubicles that you see on the uh, top. It's, it's a terrible thing. Uh, you, you cannot go uh, really agile uh, with all those things. Here are some of those findings. Things that I see happen uh, in, in, in the cubicle system is it gives you so much privacy that a person ends up Facebooking, a person ends up tweeting, a person ends up day long trading. Uh, between 9 and 3, it's trading hours. So, I mean, depending on your roles, depending on your passion, uh, you end up in, in all these things. Uh, yeah, you have seen this? Yes? Yes. Oh, yes, happens, right? So, too much of privacy is kind of a problem. Uh, something, I mean, I've been there. I mean, I've been there, I've done all this uh, bullshitting business. Uh, I've been uh, there as well. So, for me, this, this thing kind of helped. And recently, this is a new moment that's starting up. Uh, I'll, I'll just catch up on it sooner. Uh, typically, they call this thing a standing table culture. It's good. It's a way in which uh, self-discipline is enforced. I mean, Facebooking, if you tell somebody that Facebooking is bad, if you tell somebody tweeting is bad, if you tell somebody that trading is bad, it's a pathetic thing. People will actually come back to saying, aren't you not doing it back in your uh, cubicle, right? The other, thing, the other reason is, when you are here, even when someone is there in their cubicle, say a person pings them for a required reason, uh, a, a, a tester, you know, pings a developer saying, hey, I have a defect. If, if a developer is not interested in that tester's defect, he's not going to answer it in his IM or whatever chat uh, machine thing it is. Common things that happen in a cubicle system. I mean, it is breaking your communication, right? There is a barrier in, in communication. Uh, kind of things are solved in, uh, that I've seen, experienced in the standing table culture. You're right there sitting across the table. It's easier to talk, shout, say, hey, I have this problem. Can we fix this thing up? Uh, am I on the right track? Is my thinking correct? Right? Across the roads, it's easy. And things are slightly more, I mean, it, it's just kind of, this adoption is going on because there is a, a study that has come up big time that software industry has got the highest level uh, levels of what? Stress. Right? Uh, I mean, folks in software industry are leading a very, very bad life. Uh, if you're going to sit in your uh, you know, desk for more than an hour continuously, it is going to harm your health badly. So there is this book called uh, The Healthy Programmer uh, by Pragmatic Publishers. So if you're interested, uh, please, I mean, I will not say whether, you are, whether or not you're interested, please pick up the book, uh, read it. It talks so much about life, uh, right? I mean, the importance of healthy uh, living, I mean, in your workplace. So if only you're healthy in your personal life, can actually be healthy in your workplace. So, so that's very important. Uh, a reason why this thing has come up, uh, I've seen these things come up uh, of late, adopted in a lot of companies where people, when they're working here, they, when they think they want to make a ch bring about some change, they just want to change, move places, they go back, people stand here than the court. Standing is good. It's much better than you know, said, uh, you know, being uh, on, seated on a chair. So things are changing, a lot is happening. Uh, start going through these things. It's, it's really important. Right? It's, it's good for you, it's good for your teammates, right, everything. Ah, so blind obsession with tools. 
uh, the moment somebody talks about agile adoption, people talk about, okay, what's the next product that I want to buy, right? Uh, typically, people will say, okay, I need Mingle, I need uh, Jira, I need, uh, uh, what's that, Rally, I need version one, what not, uh, whichever tool is there available in the market, or go get it. Because, why? It's not because it is helping the product or the project team, it's because when they are familiar with the tool, they can put it back on the resume saying, I'm familiar with this tool. Help. I um, mean, this is pathetic, right? A reason why people go with certifications is the same thing. They can put it on their titles, right? They can add CSM, they can add PMI. What, what, I mean, what is more important is not adding it. I mean, I'm not against certification, so long as you have lessons out of it. Learn the lessons, uh, but, but we are more into this uh, certification thing. We are more into this tools thing, because, the only, because it will help you say, okay, I know this tool, I have used to this tool. How did it give you value? How did it give value to a customer? I don't have an answer, right? I mean, that's where you'll end up uh, people saying it. And the worst case, I will put it, you know, politely. Oh, well, it was not my choice. The company had actually asked it, and so I had used it. Uh, we just were using it. And, and we, we thought of using this project management tool, but then we had a poor infrastructure, it, so it was kind of flaky, right? I mean, you, you grill more, you kind of get different answers out of it. So the best thing is always focus on value delivery. Uh, I, I really repeat it. That's more important. There is so much fun. There is so much learning that comes out of it uh, than uh, using all these tools. Tools are not bad. I'm not against it, but go slowly. When you're using a tool, see at every single thing that you're using that how does it affect uh, positively your project, your team, your customer, right? I mean, that is important. Otherwise, it's just uh, a waste of money. Familiar? This thing? Yeah? When was the last time you had your performance situation? <laughs> A lot of companies in Trandrum has stopped it, is it? You're not familiar with this bell curve? <laughs> That's such a common thing, right? All companies here has got this bell curve thing? Yes, show of hands? Uh, this is with the company, not with you, so you can happily do it. show of hands. Show of hands? Yeah? Okay, for those people who have not, you know, uh, raised this, uh, I'm curious. What do you do? I mean, how, how, how does, how does it work at your company? I I don't know. I mean, I get some appraisal at the end of the day. That that's what matters to me. Yeah, that's what it does. Or is there anything else? Answers? Oh come on. Answers. Man, just speak your whatever you want to speak and then leave. That, that's what you have in your mind, is it? <laughs> it's all bell curve? Okay, let's go this other way, successful road. Let's shout. Yeah? A bell curve is a thing that happens in our company, yes? 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 yes. Yeah. So, any ideas why uh, this is a problem? Somebody wants to uh, share their experience? Uh, maybe as, as objective leaders, maybe not in your company, but what you have seen or you have experienced. Okay, maybe I'll, I'll make it even more polite. Maybe not in your company, maybe in a friend's company. <laughs> I cannot talk bad about my company in, my, in a conference that I'm doing. And that too publicly when somebody is videographing. Yeah, no. I don't want to get in trouble. Yeah. Okay, let's make it safe. Your friend's company. And you don't have to name your friend's company, so no offense to the company, so please. Volunteers. Yeah? Yes? No? What's the problem with the bell curve? <coughs> okay. I've got 10 minutes. So I'm going to rush. The trouble is, bell curve talks about saying these are very rare events. The extreme thing that you're saying, the superstars and pathetic guys. Basically, these are, these are rare events in a project. But what bell curve enforces is, you'll have to forcefully bring in, uh, you know, these kind of people. And what in reality turns out is not that there are people who are, uh, who, you know, who end of the day fits in that very rare events are really bad. It, 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 it is completely at the discretion of a boss, his boss, his super boss. Yeah, that's how it is, right? It kind of goes there. In your manager, in your performance appraisal, your boss, it's not put it even manager, your boss, uh, he says, you did a fantastic job. I think you are, you, you are there. You, you are beyond uh, 
expectations, right? And when they've drawn this bell curve uh, and you've not got a good appraisal, go back to your manager and says, yeah, it is all lost in, in, in the overall normalization. Sounds familiar? This happens, right? Uh, so, so what happens? How does that affect agility, right? It affects agility because we end up saying, uh, thinking, okay, what is it that I need to do to break this metric? That's how the mind gets motivated. You're, you're, instead of learning uh, things on your project, you're motivated to break this, right? So which is why uh, we evangelize. In some companies, they kind of break uh, you know, performance appraisal to, uh, to this performance at, uh, at all, because they, they classify things. Uh, if you know Microsoft has uh, you know, uh, thrown this uh, stack ranking thing, it's, it's on a similar principle. Right? So they've thrown it because it is hurting them. Uh, it's like people are cannibalizing inside the project. It, that is the reality, right? Just to prove that you are better off than your peer, you kind of uh, damage your peer and then you go do it. What good it does to the company? It's not. It's hurting the company. The reason why they have uh, gone. So some of the companies that I uh, that I know of, they kind of remove this performance appraisal uh, and the performance thing, performance uh, and the feedback thing. Feedback has to be continuous. It has to be very, very frequent, right? I mean, pushing it toward there towards the end of uh, the performance uh, thing is, is is a pathetic thing. Another thing that happens with agile, uh, why uh, people uh, hate agile, is a lot of meetings. Uh, people get into a meeting room, discuss. They say, meetings and collaboration. We are collaborating. Call it what are collaborating. So we need to get into a meeting room. And what happens in a meeting room? It's either uh, these things, some kind of a fights, or you have people sleeping. Like even, even as I'm talking, I, I know some of them are sleeping. So it's, it's a very common thing. Because the moment it is one way, people tend, the other folks tend to sleep. Now, quick question, when do you think this happened? Agile meetings. In which ceremony of Agile this happens? The familiar way. It happens with retrospective. The end of the demo, you show it, there's a problem, you're not happy, customers say, I'm not happy with this, you end up, teams have immediately have a retrospective and say, it's because of you, it's because of you, you're the problem, you're the problem, right? Uh, you know, they do not solve the problem at hand, rather they're trying to say whom they can do the blame game. Uh, so that's where I think agility mindset is important. Uh, it's about the team thing, it's not about uh, one person thing. The other thing is this, uh, during the demo, you would see a good half the team sleeping. Right? Somebody doing the demo, ah, it's his problem. They say in Agile, everyone has to, the entire team has to be in the demo, so I'm there. Uh, it's not my business, I will happily sleep. No, the reality is, so, so some of the tricks that works is, make sure it's not just one person who is giving the demo, make sure that comes, everyone gets a chance to demo it to the customer. Because that's how the customer, I mean, that's how every individual in a team gets the feeling of ownership. Right? That's how uh, self-discipline is brought in. And in retrospective, make it a point not to blame another person. Just focus on the incidents, right? Just focus on the subjective thing. Try to be uh, as objective as possible. And the problem is always make sure in any of your meetings, time box it. You do not arrive at it, close the meeting, and, move, and then move on. But then you really have to figure out uh, time boxing and then come to a conclusion. Now that's where facilitation comes in. Now that's where probably if you are a manager, you'll have to focus on this. Uh, it's a hard act. It's a very, very tough thing. You can read n number of books and start practicing it. It's, it's a worthwhile exercise. Now, that's something that you can take pride of. You can tell them, like, OK, I'm a good facilitator. It's a fantastic thing. Uh, not everybody can uh, be a facilitator. Not everybody can be a good conflict uh, manager. Right? A conflict resolution skill is hard skill. Right? It's very, very important. So these are skills that one needs to acquire. So every role has got something you know, uh, to hone. Uh, the other trouble I see it is, is working late hours. What they see is this, dedication, commitment, loyalty, what the ground reality is this. You have people cribbing around, say this uh, this fellow, he sucks, uh, there is crib, you know what he did, you know what she did, uh, and all these things. And basically it's a wastage, uh, waste uh, of current, waste of uh, personal time and whatnot, right? Total waste. Every team has got a superstar. Uh, Right? Yes? No? Yes? yes, yes. Another, uh, it looks uh, counterintuitive. Right? You want to reward somebody who is doing good. But here is a problem. When you reward somebody who is good, it should ideally be like, like a democracy. 
right, where the entire team votes for a good person. Uh, but what happens in reality is that the manager or over the boss, the team, decides who is the best person uh, to be, you know, declared a superstar. This is the sad thing. Uh, so, so like, like, like in a vote bank thing, uh, any person has got just one vote, right? So, so it has to be a socially elected thing, one. Secondly, a true superstar is one who is not, is not okay, he's not one who actually contributes big to the project. He's one who contributes big time to the team, right? I mean, that's a superstar. So when next time when you actually vote for a superstar, what the team needs to see, something that we actually have uh, discussing around is, uh, is it's like we tell them, what is it that you have learned from this person to call him a superstar? Now that, that changes the very dynamics of voting. Now if you say, okay, I'm going to vote him a superstar because he's brought this many changes in a project, he alone is going to be the knowledge pillar. He alone is going to be the person who knows things, who is a know-all thing. He leaves, he's going on a sick leave, the other person is actually, I mean the entire team is in a dilemma. They, they, they are on crutches. They do not know what to do. Trouble. Sounds familiar? These are familiar things, right? You have knowledge pockets in your team. Right? This, are, this is serious trouble because end of the day, man is selfish. You want to make sure life, your life is cool, you are the best guy. But here's another trouble for the same person. Here's what I tell them, uh, that person. If that person were to go on a leave, uh, if, if things are not great on a project, he is not sanctioned really. Right? This is the way you educate. So he needs to spread knowledge. Because, so, so in some of the companies that I've been, uh, companies that are genuinely agile, nobody actually asks for you know, permission for leave. They just you know, put things in notice. I send a mail. When I'm on vacation, I just send out a mail saying, hey, I won't be available next week. Done. I'm good because it gives me enough room for my personal life. And the team is good because, I mean, if not me, there's always other person in the team who can take up work and then do it. So that's a win-win situation, yes. So that's how you need to educate. I think it's all about educating you know, in a company. That, that, that's really my, what matters. The other trouble with big iterations is people coming from this still waterfall is RUP model, right? Uh, like uh, what Naresh has put it up, I liked it uh, from today's thing. It's about iteration and what? Increment. It's increment and iteration. Together is what makes it. But if you're going to have big iteration, your feedback cycle is, is long enough, right? Uh, what is the typical iteration uh, size in, in, in the agile companies here, projects that I can hear of? One week. Two weeks. Sorry? Two to three weeks. One week. Two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks. Three weeks, any? Okay. Any four weeks? In your company? <laughs> right. Basically, uh, you know, ideally one week is good. Uh, it's just enough. Two weeks, okay. Uh, three weeks, four weeks, and all is bad. So here's the trouble. You might ask why. And if you're not asking why, please ask why. What? What do you know? Or I want? <laughs> I don't hear you. Why? Okay. Why? Right? So, so here's the thing. If you're going to estimate for three weeks, four weeks, two weeks thing, your estimation becomes that much harder. Right? Uh, the whole point of Agile is about talking about yesterday's weather. Right? You're better off, I mean, you can estimate based on what was yesterday. Right? If I ask you what you want to do three weeks from now, completely, is there anybody who can say, okay, this is how my plan is going to be for the next three weeks? No. Right? So, so plan, I mean, make it one week iteration. Is that done? So if you're not meeting it, you know what needs to be changed. Maybe you have estimated it wrong, so you can correct it in the next iteration. And you have faster feedback. Basically, your motivation levels are more. And, uh, it's time out right now, so I'm going to run a uh, few things quickly. Uh, the other thing is about change priorities which is another uh, sad thing. People say, ah, this customer is such a dumbass, he doesn't, uh, you know, basically, he brings in a change in the last moment, uh, right? Familiar thing, customer is dumb, right? We, we call this thing, blame it on customer. Not really the case, so, like, like what narration and other folks have talked, it's about evolution. Uh, we are all human beings, thoughts keep uh, evolving. Documentation, I think, we have heard it in the previous talk. Metrics-driven development, please do not focus uh, too much into the metrics, see what is the value you are adding into the project that's more important. Uh, classical uh, read, this is velocity is killing uh, agility, please google for it, there's a great article written on it, uh, criticizing 
uh, this matrix driven agility thing. Uh, so please, uh, that's one thing. Technical practices, these things, uh, technical practices are not things that are uh, you know, got overnight. Uh, it's hard work, it's about a craft. We'll have to, it takes a long time to you know, get into that rhythm, uh, get into that expertise level. So it takes time, please be realistic about it. Just giving a TD training and then expecting a person to be great, you don't really get it. Uh, I was planning for a, a story, but uh, there's short of, a shortage of time. So here's it. Test pyramid, typically your test architecture uh, should be like that. Uh, unfortunately, most most of the projects, uh, even in many of the agile companies that I see, remains to be like this. It's, it's an unfortunate story. Uh, ideally, it has to be like this. Uh, and how much time do I have? Grace time. I'm done with it. Okay. Uh, so I'll probably answer any of the questions uh, off the stage because he said no more time, uh, and I need to move on. That basically the story that I want to run through. Yeah. So we are going to break for tea, coffee. Do you? Do you mind spending uh, two, three minutes for questions? We, we are okay. But we have to regroup at... Uh, for all those people who want to have a cup of tea, you can please leave. For all those people who want to listen to the story, uh, at the expense of those people who want to listen to the story. This is a story based on this uh, test pyramid thing. Most of the time when you go tell project team members that, okay, this is how the test pyramid has to be, it's hard for people to take it. Uh, and one of the uh, members is called Patrick Wilson Wells. <coughs> Uh, he has got this nice way of presenting things uh, to the folks. Uh, the test pyramid uh, is, uh, you know, is, is kind of put this way. Bottom is the bricks, middle layer is the wooden stack, top is the haystack. And the way he communicates to the teams are like this. Uh, this should be familiar for all those people who have done babysitting, who, who never, who have done, uh, you know, uh, tell this kids stories, you know, uh, how many of them have done babysitting? Show of hands. Okay, hardly any. There is enough problems at office, man. <laughs> Go home, do his babysitting, that's not my business. Yeah? That's the thing, right? Reality. Reality, right? Bad work at office. Uh, so, but there is, isn't there some person who didn't raise their hands? Who, is, uh, who knows the story? Show of hands. Okay, I need you here on stage. <laughs> Tough times. It's a story, I mean, just as the way you tell your kids, you can actually share it to the public. So many of them are so, so bad. I mean, they have not done it. You're awesome. Round of applause to the volunteer team. That's a fantastic. Bravo. They were old enough to be on their own. She asked them to leave uh, and start their own leaving. So three of them left, and the eldest one, um, who were very lazy, uh, got a uh, got some hay and built a house of hay, full of hay, so that it uh, makes him easy. It, it's an easy task for him, and then he was happy inside. The second one went. And uh, he was uh, more playful, so he just gathered some st uh, sticks, he was playing with it, and along with it he built a house, which was just, uh, I mean, made of sticks. And the third one, who was very hardworking, he uh, got brick uh, and then cement, <coughs> cement, and then he built a strong house. So after some time, the wolf uh, was going that way, he saw that uh, there's a small house which was built, uh, built with hay, and uh, there was a piglet inside, so the wolf came, knocked at the door, asked the piglet to open the door. So the piglet was so scared, uh, he just locked it. The wolf told, okay, you're not going to open it, I'll blow it out. And then he blew, uh, the house went away, the piglet started running, and he came to the second one's house. So both of them, again the same story, they went inside, locked it. Then again, the wolf told, okay, you go, you all are, or you are inside, I'll blow this away. So he blew, the house went off. And then uh, the wolf went to the third house. So it was very uh, strong. The wolf was not able to blow it. So he told, okay, you are not uh, coming out. So what I'll do is I'll enter your house through the chimney. So he went inside the chimney and uh, the three piglets yeah, together. I, I think, yeah. <laughs> to this, to this point this, this is where the crux of the story is. So thank you very much. Another round of applause for the round of applause. Yeah. Uh,
So you will go back home, try doing some babysitting. Uh, okay, so that's one lesson. Uh, so here's a quick thing, uh, just to rush thing off, conclude it. Go back to this story. The clay, uh, you have seen the third piglet, I mean, that built it around, you see this thing. The strong thing is uh, the unit test in your project. You are the strong ones, they are the foundation, right? Your unit test coverage has got to be just enormous. But then, that's not enough. Your, your projects, you've got components interacting with each other. So you need to figure out if the handshaking is going well. So that's where the integration test comes in. That's where the acceptance test comes in. Right? So that's where your integration test is, is in the middle of a pyramid. It's, it's, it's much lesser uh, in, 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 in comparison with the density. And finally, you have the uh, GUI tests, uh, which is A. And that's very brittle. Uh, GUI is basically, UI is very fluid in, in, in our projects. And there's no point uh, building huge, you know, uh, GUI-based tests. It's, it's just uh, wastage of money. It's just uh, more uh, bad stress to the team. Uh, this is what I have learned out of hard experience in spite of having so many uh, books and stuff. So you're doing it, you're doing it at your own cost. So that basically is a lesson. Make sure the test pyramid is like this for you to have, you know, a smooth, successful project and you can go home happily, do some babysitting as well. Right, so I'm done with my uh, talk. Thank you all for your patient hearing. If you have any feedback, uh, please go to speaker rate and give me feedback of my talk. I would be very happy to hear uh, your constructive feedback. Thank you all, thank you very much.